Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, The Ozempic Effect and What It Means for Consumer Shopping Trends. We're going to spend our time today exploring this new wellness consumer and what this means for category management and shopper insights teams. To introduce myself, I'm Katie Gross. I'm the Chief Customer Officer here at Suzy. My background has always been in market research and market research technology. Will, how about you introduce yourself to the audience? Hi everyone, I'm William Samarosa. I'm the SVP of market research here at Suzy. I help develop new products that are useful to research teams, uh, hopefully like yours. Um, and I'm also passionate about wellness research. I have a background where I actually was on the client side, uh, mainly in pharma before I came to Suzy. Awesome. Thanks for joining me, Will. Super excited to get started. So first of all, let's meet Susie. Susie is an end-to-end -end consumer insights platform that's combining quant, call, and high-quality audiences into the same single connected research cloud. And today's program is going to include a mix of data from Susie's consumer panel and anecdotal information that we're seeing across industry. Our webinar is going to be split into a few different sections. And in just a few minutes, Will is going to unpack Susie's approach to reaching this new wellness consumer. And later on in the program, we'll have a chat about how teams can use the latest shopping trend data to drive actionable and impactful insights for your brands. So first up, we're going to dig into the data. The stats I'm going to share with you are from a series of surveys we conducted between November 2023 and April 2024 to 1,000 US consumers. The data was census weighted across age, gender, ethnicity, and region. On the back end of that study, we ran what's called a driver's analysis. This is a type of study where we actually derive what consumers are, are saying and doing rather than just asking them. So you'll be able to see a combination of stats today. One will be the actual things consumer answered and said that they do from the actual survey, as well as some analytics-based um, learnings around three key drivers of behavior. The first is satisfaction with your overall wellness, uh, state of your overall wellness. What makes someone feel like they're actually health and uh, healthy and well? Interest in adding something new to your wellness routine. And then also concerned with your own health and wellness. These are the frameworks to which we want to start to look at the data that we have so we can understand what the impact is going to be on your category and your shopper. Awesome. So why wellness? Well, the term wellness is everywhere and we mean literally everywhere from the latest trends to the fading trends to think pieces about what the wellness category even is the term is inescapable major retailers like target and amazon have dedicated wellness sections on their websites now and every day a new news article pops up to talk about the latest in wellness and even though it's a big focus of our talk today a lot of it's going to be on this new wellness consumer. It's important for us to understand where consumers are today in order for us to uh, look ahead into those kind of changing tides. What's interesting about this wellness aspect and being everywhere is that it's actually driving specific behaviors, specifically anxiety about one's own wellness. One of the key predictors of consumers not feeling confident about their own health and wellness was all the information that was out there and not knowing what to believe or where the right source of information to come from. So this is something that's critical to think about when you are messaging uh, for your category and for your shopper. Yeah. So this wellness shift really comes as no surprise to us um, as we're expecting continued growth in wellness across categories. According to recent Bloomberg data, the global wellness industry is expected to reach $8.5 trillion by 2027. And that's a 57% increase in revenue from today's numbers. And it's important to understand that wellness doesn't just solve for one consumer need state. When we look at wellness, we need to think beyond just physical health. Wellness is a lifestyle, and the products that category managers and shopper insights teams support are an integral part to consumer wellness. One of the top predictive needs of someone who's looking to actually expand their wellness routine was the attitude of wanting to be able to improve their overall general mood and their positive outlook. So health and wellness is really more holistic than it used to be. It's not just about having a temperature, it's about knowing how that end consumer is actually feeling and how they want to feel. That's awesome. And what we're seeing right now is a bit of a shift towards a slower approach to the wellness infused lifestyle. 
Consumers overall are trying to just be kinder to themselves, and that's reflective of their approach to wellness today and the way that they're shopping for those wellness-related products. The top, one of the strongest indicators that we had of someone wanting to be engaged in wellness was a very specific attitude around needing to slow down. And that was reflecting back on their past health choices. So the, the attitude that I need to make up for poor choices I made when I was younger is a top predictor of someone being open to adding to the routine. And it's something that always makes me smile. Absolutely. I remember chatting to my sister a couple of years ago and I said, wellness, of course, I'm going to go work out on my Peloton during my lunch break. And then in the evening, I'm going to go for a run. And she was like, that's not taking care of yourself. That's just more punishment to the physical body. Um, and so it's so true. It's just that slower approach to kind of wellness. Um, a big values trend um, that we're seeing that greatly impacts the business of folks on today's webinar is around wellness at home. And the trend of wellness at home first started, of course, to rise in 2020 when we were all stuck at home <laughs> during the height of the pandemic. It is, however, a trend that's not only stuck around post-COVID, it's actually continued to gain momentum. And in fact, a whopping 84% of consumers are prioritizing their home wellness routines. And they're doing so through a variety of means. Sleep, my favorite, came in as number one way that consumers are prioritizing wellness at home with 72% of consumers ranking that as their top priority. And other top wellness drivers include relaxation at 65%, nutrition at 59%, mental health at 58%, and fitness much further down at 48%. And these values can of course be an important driver when you're thinking about strategy planning. What's interesting about this is that even those consumers who are feeling confident in their own health and wellness, these are these values that you see here are still reflective of what drives them. One of the top drivers of wanting to stay engaged in your own health and wellness is worrying about your own, uh, how much energy that you actually have. Sleep, nutrition are all related to that. It's, it's more than the sum of its parts. And then an additional aspect of that is staying in control. I want to be in control of how I feel, right? And these are all values that ladder up to some larger emotional need that could be very relevant when you're looking to target your shopper and really redefine your category. Yeah, for sure. And this next value is one that's particularly interesting to me. It's around a consumer commitment to that kind of slower living lifestyle. As someone who recently moved out of New York and is trying to give up my caffeine addiction, <laughs> this one is near and dear to my heart. But this doesn't mean giving up a connected life, but more so it's about finding a balance between being plugged in and logged off. And 86, 80, sorry, 87% of consumers said that they are influenced by brands that are committed to a slow living lifestyle. From a tech standpoint, we're talking about products that can go into grayscale mode and make technology much easier on their eyes. Or ones that have included screen time or downtime monitors that suggest when it's time to take a break. And slow living goes beyond just technology. In fashion, we're actually seeing more of a rejection of fast fashion and embrace of slow living, sustainable fashion. Same thing with home decor as well, where people are creating intentional, thoughtfully curated and sustainable interiors to their homes. As consumers look for more ways to be intentional with their consumption, they want to know that the brands that they are choosing to engage with are supportive of this journey. This is important to note for folks who are thinking about their category drivers or even kind of product location in stores. Our next wellness trend today is around self-care. So 86% of consumers believe in engaging in self-care that has a significant impact on their overall wellness. And self-care minded consumers are thinking about self-care in similar ways um, that they're treating wellness at home. For a few years, we saw a lot of headlines that equated self-care with products, a new face mask or a new foot spa, for example. But now consumers are thinking about taking care internally. So 76% of consumers are providing themselves with care by sleeping. 67% <laughs> through exercise, 61% through hobbies. There's brand synergy with all of those self-care activities. But the main self-care driver is the activity itself. And the products are there to act as a support to that activity. So now we've given you the highlights of some of the recent Suzy Wellness research, we have to ask, is this all about to change with the rise of a new drug? And the answer is, well, maybe. So let's unpack this a little bit more. 
We're seeing headlines every other day about Ozempic, a semaglutide that helps lower blood sugar by helping the pancreas make more insulin. So this drug was first approved in 2017 as a means to treat pre-diabetes and has made headlines over the last six months or so after seemingly becoming popular amongst celebrities as a weight loss management tool, particularly on my Instagram where I am bombarded daily with messaging. I think this is going to be an interesting topic that's going to continue to develop. There's two polarizing drivers that we also saw in this study. The first is trust. There's a lot of snake oil out there and consumers aren't sure of what to trust. And what's interesting about celebrities is that if it works for them, sometimes there's assumptions that it must be safe. Same goes when it comes to shoppers and categories. We've seen a lot of times in these types of studies involving wellness is that a brand might not be considered legitimate unless it actually gets onto your store shelves. If it's safe enough to be on your sh store shelf, then it must be safe enough for me. And so what are the, the signals that, that people are using to guide their decision makings when it comes to brands and how they're going to actually uh, buy these products is something that that category and shopper managers are going to need to keep a, a, an eye on as this narrative continues to develop in the news cycle. Yeah, absolutely. Love that phrase, snake oil. Definitely half my Instagram posts, I'm sure, are definitely snake oil. So given this shift, have the age of Ozempic permanently changed the state of the consumer wellness landscape? And how is this new drug going to affect consumer shopping behaviors across multiple categories? The short answer is that the impacts we, and probably many of you on the call, are today kind of seeing and feeling are not that big yet. But we're seeing that many consumers don't yet know what semaglutides are and definitely don't know what they're used for. But we are seeing this number rise over time. When we asked consumers about semaglutides back in November 2023, 35% of respondents expressed a familiarity with them. We'll fast forward to April 2024 and all of the award ceremonies have happened. When we asked them again, 40% of our respondents are now familiar. And this rising level of familiarity is pretty significant because only 1.7% of the American population is actually currently using a semaglutide. I say using, meaning prescribed, so legally. And despite the celebrity headlines around the drug, the average American that has access to this is still only for those very genuine health reasons. And even though such a small percentage of the population is actually using as being prescribed semaglutide, 14% of our survey respondents said that they would be interested in trying this new drug should it be made available to them. But since it won't be available to the wider population for some years, you may be asking yourself, why are we talking about this today? The article example on the screen specifically references the food business, but what we're already starting to see with only 1.7% of the population on Ozempic or other semaglutides is a bigger impact on industries across the board. Let's think about it. If people are eating less, there's an obvious impact on grocery shopping and of course dining out. But what about retail as clothing sizes start to drop? or vitamins and supplements, as people will need to be more intentional about getting those necessary nutrients. The way we exercise may be impacted also. The list really goes on and on. And we expect to see some major shifts in caffeine management and shopper insights in the coming years. We've seen how quickly consumer behaviors have shifted in recent years and how hard it's been for some brands to keep up. This time around, we're here to help you really start to get ahead. So to round out the two parts of our conversation today, we're gonna to spend the rest of our time talking about how a deeper understanding of this new consumer can help inform your own decision-making. All right, so let's chat. And as a reminder, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them into the question box below. And we'll do our best to answer a few of them towards the end. Righty. So, well, let's get started. Love to know your thoughts. So as drugs like Ozempic become more widely available, what types of ripple effects do we expect to see for category management and shopper insights teams? I think we've already touched on it in terms of all the things that uh, Ozempic could impact as it reaches a higher level of penetration. You know, things from how much are how much do people weigh on airplanes and how much, you know, food are they actually buying are going to change what there's actually demand for, right? And how much things are going to cost. But at the, at the end of the day, consumers are still like driven a lot by like their subconscious and their emotional needs, right? So it's 
just because you have these drugs doesn't mean that there's not going to be needs to take care of your wellness in other ways. We've already seen that that mental health and wellness is critical as part of the overall wellness. You know, if you don't feel good, you know, emotionally, you're never going to really feel good physically either, right? So that's not going away, right? These, this is still something that's going to have to be addressed. The other aspect is really going to be messaging, right? One of the things that's interesting that we've seen from the driver studies that we've done, even ubiquitous products like vitamins and minerals and supplements create other concerns. It's amazing to me how many consumers are actually concerned about the side effects of taking a supplement on a daily basis. And that's something as simple as a vitamin, right? When we start to get to more complicated drugs, how are consumers going to start to feel in terms of their own confidence and what are they going to need to know, especially when they're shopping throughout that category? Yeah, for sure. You touched on that, that emotional piece. It's so key. And I think, you know, what drugs like Ozempic and semaglutides can do for many consumers who have really struggled with their weight over a long period of time is really start to help that confidence um, back in the way they look, um, et cetera, the ability to kind of um, exercise in a way they maybe had not in the past, um, even going on rides at Disney, things like that, that have always been kind of restrictive for them based on, on weight in the past. And that's an important aspect. And, and those are very significant tactical aspects too, to think about when you're, when you're working in this category or, or addressing the shoppers, those emotional outcomes are really what's so critical. Weight loss and health in general is an abstract thing that can be difficult to understand. That's why consumers default to seeing what's on the shelf to maybe determine what's safe or what's right for them, right? So how you actually frame the emotional outcomes, what you'll be able to do, what is the, the ultimate end payoff is really going to be critical in shaping how consumers actually start to adopt things like semaglutide as it becomes more ubiquitous. Yeah, for sure. So how can the folks on the call take what we already know about today's wellness consumer and start to apply it kind of like throughout the work that they're conducting already and the research projects they already have underway? So there's a, a number of ways that that we like to look at this, right, from a consumer centric standpoint. And it's one side of it is making sure that you're covering the range of experiences and needs when you're developing a survey to make some sort of decision. And I like to make lists, right? There's this, this really overused saying that you can't take attendance by asking who's not there, right? Because it just doesn't work that way. So make sure that you remember what drives consumer behavior when you're developing your research approaches really helps you create that checklist of things to cover. The first is going to be the functional components. You still need to describe what your product is or your, your advertising still needs to explain what the functional benefits are. It's important to the category, it's important to the shopper, but that's always half the story. Since I've been in market research like almost 23, 24 years ago, I remember doing max dips where we always used to have to separate the functional benefits from the emotional benefits because the functional benefits would always win and it would ruin the whole study. Since, since COVID, it's flipped. Those emotional benefits are always the top performers in these max diff studies when you look at, at outcomes, whether it's, it's a health and wellness product or even like, you know, an ice cream, right? It's, it's how consumers feel. So don't forget that. You've got your functional side. Now, what are the emotional outcomes that you need to really be understanding from the category and from the shopper perspective? Having a more holistic perspective is going to help you. The next is don't be afraid of advanced research approaches. Consumers are really good at describing experiences, but they're not good at telling you why they do certain things. That's a, that's a, a fundamental human truth. So don't be afraid to use some more advanced approaches, such as, you know, uh, derived analytics. Get uh, a, an end statement, you know, I'm satisfied or I'm confident, and look at what kinds of statements you can actually correlate to that using advanced analytics. I think that helps you understand some of the subconscious drivers as well. And Susie was always anxious to help consumers or customers if they want to explore that type of research. Yeah, for sure. We'll definitely come on to a little bit more about the kind of the surveys and the structure of, of um, methodologies in a second as well. I was starting to think just before um, about the types of categories that we're going to expect to see really impacted by Ozempic and, and similar drugs. A friend of mine recently lost um, a, a lot of weight and was able to purchase a different ladder because that ladder was unable to um, hold a person over 250 pounds, for example. So the ladder industry could be impacted <laughs> by Ozempic. And I know that Professor Galloway does talk about the second order and third order kind of impacts of drugs like Ozempic too. He talked a little bit about airplane rides and clothing, but what the other categories do you think are going to be impacted? Well, I actually, I, I do think um, things that, that relate to like what consumers can actually do is going to be critical. When you're not hungry, when you're feeling well, it unlocks a lot of things that people don't normally do. You know, more experiential things like, you know, going on vacations, that not just for the destination, but for the experience, how people choose to learn, how they socialize, confidence in your wellness and, and not being distracted by the physicality, the humanness of what's bothering you really does open you up to explore new things. And I think that's one of the key emotional benefits that's really going to be critical down the line. 
Yeah, for sure. And for the for the companies that are on the phone, kind of how do you think they can keep up to speed with this trend that's changing so quickly and looking at the kind of the, those impacts across not just food and beverage, but as we just kind of mentioned, how do you think they can keep up to speed with these types of trends? So these trends are moving fast and they're going to just keep moving faster. So the first thing is, is to keep a regular read on what's what's actually driving behavior. Keep your thumb on the pulse. Things do change quickly and you want to be ahead of it, not behind it. Right. So that means regularly tracking the, the functional and emotional state of your cons of those consumers. What's important to them as they shop these categories and what are the, the leading indicators of a behavior change? At the end of the day, that's what businesses run on, is someone going from not buying a product to buying a product, from buying another brand to another brand. So understanding and identifying what those leading indicators of behavior change is going to be critical, especially over time. If As people become more familiar or more comfortable with a topic, how is that going to change outcomes? Does that mean you can change the priority of how you position certain aspects of this, right? Should you focus on different demographics or different outcomes? This is all going to change as consumers get more experience and more comfortable with this area. Yeah. Let's talk about like innovation for a moment. What types of innovation opportunities do you think this opens up? Pretty, pretty fast. Yeah, I mean, some of the stuff that we're seeing come out is of, of like some of the cutting edge research too is, is how your wellness impacts your cognitive, uh, you know, abilities, right? So I don't think it's just about feeling well, it's about, it'll soon eventually be about performance not just feeling your best, but being your best. And I think that's going to be an interesting new space for, for the wellness category to, to start to explore. Yeah. So now we start to learn a little bit about this new consumer, specifically for the folks on the call, what do you think the category management and those shopper insights teams are going to need to start thinking about? And how can they start to kind of really talk to these types of consumers? It's touch points. Uh, it, it's amazing to me how important the uh, a products association with retailers and with other uh, products in that category drive trustworthiness, right? And wellness at the end of the day is stuff that you take into you, you ingest a lot of these things, right? So really positioning your category and the shopper experience in a way that's going to allow you to add value to the category. You know, being associated with a brand or with an ingredient and having your own brand emphasis and, and even equity to help advance that those outcomes is going to be critical. Touch points are really is, are what's going to shape this at the end of the day. If you're seeing news and media all the time, and you actually move down the funnel to start exploring these topics, those touch points are really going to be where behavior actually starts to change. So mapping that customer journey, understanding where they're starting, what is that emotional set? What is it that they need? What is the higher order outcomes that they're looking for? And really tailoring that journey in a way that's going to help drive decisions, you know, one way or the other is going to be critical. Yeah. So this so, is new, right? So inform your brand is going to offer information about this. Yeah, for sure. Everyone has to jump on it. Um, you started to talk a little bit earlier about the types of methodologies that companies should be using to start to really understand this new consumer. So we know, that, of course, the, the wellness consumer story does not end with the data that we've just shown today. What are some of those best practices that brands should be incorporating into the research they're conducting? Well, and this is particularly true for shopper and category management teams. One of the first rules of like sound fundamental research is you should never ask anything that you can observe, right? It's important to ask questions about things you can observe, right? But look at the signals that you actually already have as a category and as a shopper and let that shape what it is that you actually then go and learn from the actual consumer. So what are you seeing that you need to more to understand more about? And then turning that into a survey that consumers can actually give you meaningful feedback on should be based on experiences. Right. Remember, consumers aren't always good at telling you what they're going to do or why they're going to do it. We're human. Like we don't always know all the subconscious things that are driving us, but we're really good at talking about experiences and our own feelings and opinions. Right. So rely more on what you can see to shape what it is that you're going to ask so that consumers are able to answer you more accurately, particularly when it's talking about their own experiences. And then to really understanding what those experiences are throughout the user journey and throughout the category. Right. And staying on top of what the functional and emotional outcomes are at different touch points is really going to help you stay ahead. Yeah, I'm sure. And you kind of mentioned mentioned it many times over consumers are terrible and necessarily kind of really understanding themselves. And then what we say versus what we do, that gap between kind of say and do is so key in market research to really understand. 
So we've talked a little bit about the kind of rise of Ozempic um, and the, us having to get smarter kind of predictive behavior. So for example, 14% of those that we surveyed said they'd be interested in Ozempic, but that may or may not be the case when they actually have access to it. So what is the best way that companies can start to really bridge that gap between say and do? It's understanding what are the conditions and the situations that lead to an outcome. And I can give you a good example, which, which I find fascinating. In this study, we asked on a scale of one to seven, how satisfied are you with your own health and wellness, right? And I, I can I asked a whole bunch of statements that were about experiences written in the first person that consumers could agree to or disagree to. The most satisfied and the most engaged consumers in their own health and wellness, the, the top predictor of being someone, someone being top two box is then still not feeling they fully understand how to best take care of their own health and wellness. These consumers have already committed or are on a wellness journey but they're not done. They're still out there looking for new information, right? You don't achieve an end state in health and wellness. It's an ongoing thing. And the most satisfied consumers still don't believe that they know all that they need to know. That's a great thing for category and shopper management is that there's in this wellness category, there is an actual hunger for information and brands and stores and retailers have the ability to actually give information in a way that they're going to trust and be able to make decisions on, right? So knowing that this is not an end state, it's just part of a journey that's going to be ongoing and maintaining that journey is going to be critical. Yeah. Um, and what do you think um, more about kind of as you've been looking at the data for a long time now, you know, sh can you share what you've been seeing really around those consumer attitudes that are kind of shifting and that kind of tracking over time piece? Yeah. So what's interesting, just a couple, of, like even a year ago or two years, I think it was 18 months ago that we did the first one was that there's a large cohort of consumers that don't want to fix what's not broken. All right. Uh, I'm only going to change behavior once I feel like there's something wrong. And those numbers have been regularly declining. But but what's interesting about that is among millennials, as they age, they're no longer waiting for something to go wrong. There's enough news and, and buzz out there that it's driving anxiety, in fact. like there could, People are overly concerned about their health and wellness before they even have a symptom or some other reason to do that. The yeah. other one is what's happening to people that they know, care, and love. Another leading indicator of, of, of increased engagement in uh, health and wellness is knowing someone who had a health impact, right? So I think, you know, the, the, the health and wellness issue is no longer something that is a problem that you solve. It's becoming a lifestyle issue that consumers are, are constantly looking to engage, especially as their own, especially millennials, their parents are aging out, seeing them suffer, you know, making maybe decisions that they wouldn't have wanted them to make themselves is really driving and shaping how they're behaving now. And it's it's each time that we do one of these, there's more and more consumers who are being proactive before they've actually experienced an issue. Yeah, it's interesting you say that it kind of reminds me of when Botox came out all those years ago, it was very much about treating people who had rainfalls, but actually now it's very much a preventative um, instead of like, I don't want to get them in the first place. And of course, it's so widespread on what was a very confusing drug at the time. It's now used by so many people um, and not just those Hollywood actors. Um, and of course, the second order impact of I don't have to get the bangs cut anymore. I don't have to purchase all of those anti-wrinkle creams if I'm using Botox and so on. So, well, a couple of audience questions that came in um, into the chat here. So one of those first questions was, is there any kind of types of survey questions or even qualitative questions that are the most effective at starting to talk about some of these new consumers? Yeah, it's, it, it's again, it's starting off with behaviors that are either observed or have already happened and avoiding the why questions and talking about the experiences leading up to the moment that matters. Moments that matter are when someone goes from considering to like actively shopping to making those purchases. Understanding all of the emotional and functional things that are going on and the relevance of touch points at those moments are how consumers are going to be able to give you the best feedback. Don't bother asking them why they did something. Like it's, they'll give you an answer, but they don't always know. They do know what they were feeling and what they were experiencing at given moments in their journey. And focusing on that is going to really help you focus on, you know, what you should do as a result. Yeah, for sure. I know that a lot of our clients are using um, call and video open ends um, at the moment, and they're not asking why, tell me why you purchase, but tell me about the product. How does it work for you? And then they're really yep. getting kind of like that, that under, underlying current instead. What about recommendations for CPG brands who are trying to track changes in wellness consumers um, to keep up kind of what kind of frequency do you recommend? What types of ways of tracking do you recommend? Yeah, so I, I do think it's important to to set a cadence that's set up with your other trackers. Sometimes too, you can get too much information, right? And then they're not able to do stuff. So making sure that you set this up in a cadence that fits with whatever your sales reports are, maybe your comms and your equity trackers, 
trackers that now look at behaviors and need states in relationship to those other signals that you're getting are going to tell you a more complete story. And make sure that you're able to then go and look at what did consumers say, how were, did they say they were feeling at certain points throughout the journey, and looking at what's actually going on with your other trackers and your other signals out there. What is going on in terms of the sales? What is going on in terms of engagement in this category? It begins to paint a more complete picture if you can actually sequence this in a way that allows you to have cadences that 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 better inform each other. That's awesome. All right, we're coming up on time, but any last thoughts or recommendations for this audience, Will? Yeah, well, it's just as wellness is developing very quickly uh, into, into new spaces, so is our ability to do advanced analytics on what drives behavior. It's becoming easier and cheaper by the day. Don't be afraid to, to start to explore new ways to understand what is driving wellness behaviors. There's more and more data out there. There's going to be more and more abilities to make predictions. Don't get left behind. Don't be afraid of it. It's not like it, it's not like it was 10 years ago. This is this has gotten a lot more advanced. Awesome. All right. Well, that is all we have time for today. Thank you so much to uh, Will for all of the amazing research and sharing his uh, his best practices and ideas here. And I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks, everyone.